All right, let's get started. This is, uh, what, the fifth? Eric, fifth annual Reject Conf. Thank you. Um, so like I said before, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort uh, by time, shortest first, uh, so we can get as many people talking to you as possible so we can convey as much information as possible. Um, one thing I will say, uh, lessons learned in the past, um, if you're too ad-like, I'm gonna boot you. And if you play um, Rush, I'm gonna boot you. Uh, those are the lessons we've learned. So stick to those and we should be good. Um, so did you guys sort yourselves? Go ahead. You hoodie, you ready to go? You hoodie, get off the phone. Are you gonna be able to go with standalone? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll make sure you do it. Oh, oh. Can you hold on that button? <coughs> okay. Um, you hear that? Give me yes. Phone. Give me your phone. Um, I'm going to talk about Johnson. Who are you? Uh, I'm Yehuda, work at Engine Yard, work on Merv and some other internal stuff. Uh, Johnson is a JavaScript to Ruby bridge. So I wrote this terminal, which is what I'm going to use to demo stuff. Actually, this might be tough with the standalone. Um, hey. So Johnson does some uh, obvious stuff that you would expect to do in JavaScript mode, like, you know, that. Right, but then you can go into Ruby mode and you can see that same variable. Um, you can make an array in, in Ruby mode. You can go back into JavaScript mode, and look at it. You can index into it. You can do that. You're st we're still in JavaScript. Um, you can actually do this. Cool. Hey, Yehuda, do you want to move your, uh, the bottom of your terminal window up so it's not colliding with the... Yeah, no problem. Um, you can do that, which is pretty cool. Um, that basically lets you pass a function, a JavaScript function, into a block. Um, uh, yeah, the block, get, the function gets converted to a block, which gets uh, rendered on the, used on the Ruby side, passed into that map function. Um, we also have, which is like the basic demo, is a templator function. So uh, that's what, this is what the function looks like. It's crazy. Um, but it does stuff like this. Uh, looks a lot like ERB. Um, let's give it. And then you can do. Uh, right. This is just standard JavaScript that'll work on the client as well. Um, but then you can go into Ruby mode and you can say context, just call it hello, and you can say name, let's just give it something else so you can tell it's different. Go back into JavaScript mode, you can call that on hello, and it works. Um, yes, sir? Is this, uh, are you interpreting the JavaScript? Or yeah, you can see it's basically eval JavaScript but it's evaling it inside of the spider monkey context. Okay. Um, so what's cool about this is that if you actually look at the function, you see that there's a with statement there, which is doing with of a Ruby object, and then it knows about how to do attributes. Um, if you do, what was that array again? If you do this, it returns back the method, just like you would expect in JavaScript. Um, and basically, there's a whole bunch of other stuff like, um, you know, Stuff like that, like, does that property exist? Or we already kind of showed this, that. Um, basically, all the kinds of things that you'd expect to work correctly in JavaScript actually do with Ruby objects. Oh, you can do, like, new Ruby.array, new Ruby.file. Stuff like that. Um, whoops. And you can do that. Um, so 
basically it's sort of like what Rhino is to Java. It's, this is to Ruby. lets you pull down Ruby stuff into the JavaScript and run it in JavaScript, which, yeah, the uh, most obvious use case is testing, like being able to run what should be browser code on the client, on the server, rather. So that's it. And who wrote Johnson? So Johnson, it's a weird story. Um, I wrote something called Ruby Spider Monkey, or I, I modified a thing that Japanese guys wrote called Ruby Spider Monkey. Um, these two guys uh, from Seattle RB, John Barnett and um, Aaron Patterson, <laughs> wrote this thing called, or used to write R. Kelly and convert it into Johnson. And this other guy, Matthew, has been running some, the fork of Ruby Spider Monkey in production for a long time, and he's basically figured out weird garbage collection issues that cause seg faults. So all four of us, um, noticed that we were doing the same project and now we're working on it together, basically. I wrote the interpreter, they wrote most of the clean C code that exists, stuff like that. And the code is available on Git, on uh, GitHub, under uh, Jay Barnett, uh, if you want to hack on it. Did we try using the uh, the little guy? Okay. Gotcha. We're just set it on the podium. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, I'm presenting a little project I'm working on. Uh, I'm Sebastian Delmont. I work for StreetEasy.com, and I live here in New York City. We've been uh, working on a project we call Arepa. And uh, as you can see, we're trying to, uh, we picked the name before we decided what we we're going to do with it. It's supposed to mean the administration of remote equipment can be pretty awesome. And uh, well, what is Arepa? The idea is we use Puppet to manage our servers, but we hate Puppet. Puppet has a bunch of problems and uh, little annoyances that drive us crazy, so we want to do something new to use it. It's a declarative, declarative configuration of servers, where you specify what each server needs to do or what, what is its role, and you specify what you need, you need to perform each role, and it will do it for you doing uh, parallel execution over SSH. The idea is to make it a very simple implementation with a simple Ruby DSL. It might contradict the idea of simple implementation, but compared to Puppet, anything is simple. Uh, and in front of Ryan here, I'm afraid of using the word simple. It's not going to be that minimalist, but it's, it's a frame of mind. We're going that, in that direction. Puppet's in the top 10 for the flawed gems. Yes, I, and uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's top five or two. And the idea is to have no abstractions, just shortcuts. One of the problems we have with Puppet is that it tries to abstract the complexity of managing multiple servers. They try to, they pretend you can write the installation script for a master-slave database server into something you can deploy on a Debian machine or on a Sun server without changing the code, and that's just not possible. What we want to achieve with this is to just let you do automation of the process without trying to abstract the complexity. A little bit of an example of what we want to do is you will be able to define a host, give it a host name, set some variables like what's the IP address of the host name or any other kind of variables, and uh, you say, you declare that that host is a database server and it's a slave database for the master Duane. And you also defi uh, define what the service database server Involves. It requires a package MySQL and it requires a file to be placed at the etc myconfig, which comes from an ERB template you generate. It is to have something as simple as that, and even the package is just a function you define, which ex execute yum install unless that package is already in the system. The, the idea is that Arepa will, might come with a standard library of helper functions like this, but you can write your own depending on your needs. 
Can, if you're can, can you back up one second? Uh, next slide. What the unmust part? I'm confused about. Um, so this is standard Ruby. Are you pre-processing this into something else, or? Uh, well, the all, sorry, the unmust should have had a, an exact call in it. I just made that up on the fly before for the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Um, we already have some code that can do this, that can have, especially, we have an exec question mark and an exec without a question mark. So you can do a, a dry run that will actually call the RPM for the unless, if you use the question mark. It will tell you what it will have to run if you really want to do it. But even, have, it has to perform some calls on the servers to see what your current environment is to decide what it has to change. Uh, if you're interested, contact me at the Garuka party or email me at sd at notso.net or at 3dc.com or check it at github sd arepa. And uh, that's it. Anyone else? Whoa. Do we have anyone else who wants to give a talk? We got, we got, we got, I know we got those guys, but come on people, this is pathetic. This is a short line. This should be a lot of people. Nice and fast. Anything you want to show? Get your asses up in line. <laughs> this is a drinking line in New York. This would be all over. This is a line to drink. In New York, and we'd be all over. Test, test. You just need to talk Be out. Loud. Speak louder. Than you okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm Gregory Brown. Uh, some of you have seen some of my stuff on O'Reilly Ruby, uh, or maybe used uh, Ruby Reports. Uh, actually, wrote a book with Mike Milner about Report. Uh, it was self-published, and self-publishing was a learning experience. Uh, I learned that I suck at marketing. Uh, I was supposed to bring five copies today to be raffled off. <laughs> uh, so the first five people that send me their shipping address, I will send the book to. Uh, but I'm actually wanted to talk a bit about the uh, Ruby Mendicant project. Uh, how many people heard of that? Okay. Uh, so basically, a mendicant is someone who survives off of donations and the generosity of others. It's normally used in the context of religion. A Ruby mendicant is something like that. Uh, you can see the details on Google, but uh, here's the Reader's Digest version. Uh, thanks to 70 people, and in addition to Ruby Central, and in addition to the Mountain West Ruby Conf, uh, I have funding to take 22 weeks off of work to do open source stuff for Ruby. Uh, So the project that I'm going to be working on is called Prawn, which is already having naming problems. <laughs> um, and it's a PDF library that aims to be fast, tiny, and nimble, just like the majestic sea creature. Uh, <laughs> it's not yummy. <laughs> uh, so you may wonder, what about PDF Writer, which is more or less our standard PDF writing library in Ruby right now? Well, it's basically unmaintainable. And the unfortunate truth is I know that because I'm the current maintainer. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so there's some big goals for Prom. Uh, one of them is Ruby 1.9 support, which as we looked into PDF Writer, that might have been a little bit hard. Uh, we'll be doing Prom from the ground up on Ruby 1.9. Uh, internationalization, we're aiming to support Unicode on both Ruby 1.8 and 1.9 and actually allow people who aren't speaking English to use PDF generation in Ruby, which would be nice. Uh, speed is a big thing. Uh, PDF Writer currently generates PDFs about quick, as quickly as your run-of-the-mill laser printer prints a PDF, uh, which is slow. We could do better. Uh, an API for Ruby is uh, PDF Writer was mostly a port of a PHP library, and I'd rather write Ruby than PHP, and I think a lot of people here would too. Uh, and a complete spec suite. Uh, luckily, there's a PDF reader library now, so we can do things like automated testing, which Austin wasn't able to do while he was developing PDF Writer. <coughs> so really, I'd like to talk about my short-term goals for the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm using geologic time scale for uh, the code name <laughs> for things. Uh, so I'm starting way at the beginning with Hadean Prawn. Uh, somewhere in the not too distant future, we will get Jurassic Prawn. <laughs> uh, so in the next couple of weeks, I'm starting with at the beginning. And if anyone has any experience at all with implementing PDF, it's a 1,310 page long spec. So it's painful. But we're starting with the simple stuff. Lines, boxes, polygons. I'm going to work on getting full color support, um, allowing you to color those things in. Page sizes, orientations of pages, um, some callbacks and things like that, and then Bezier curves and circles. So basically, you'll be able to draw some pretty things within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm hoping to get that done by May 5th. It looks like it may get done sooner than that. But uh, as soon as I'm done with that, I'll start working on text, which will be painful. Uh, the question is, what can it do now? And the answer is basically nothing, but it can draw lines. <laughs> uh, so this is the result of uh, a week of swearing at the PDF spec and uh, two days of coding. And <laughs> it's not much to look at yet, but this is going to change fast. And please, because I really hope in six months from now that this library will no longer be called Prime, it'll be called PDF Writer. Uh, Please pay attention to it and let me know what you think. So that's it. Testing. How's that coming up in the back? I think it's good. Anybody hear me? Hello? Can anybody hear me? This kid? Apparently, you need to be in theater to actually <laughs> use the microphones. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dan DiMaggio. There's my picture of me and my robot. Uh, I used to be an embedded Linux developer, and I've been doing Ruby on Rails for the last year. But I need a job, so anybody uh, <laughs> <laughs> needs that. Um, I, I decided to uh, do this talk about a minute and a half ago, so I don't know exactly what I'm going to talk about, but a lot of people have been uh, looking at my laptop and thinking it's pretty cool, so I thought I'd show it off to everybody at once. This <laughs> is an easier way to do it. It's called the OSOS EEEPC, or as they like to abbreviate it, the EPC, with the E kind of you know, being longer. Um, it, it's a uh, Linux-based device, uh, or you can get Windows XP, but we won't talk about that. Um, it has a VGA out, which is really cool because that never worked on any of my previous laptops under Linux. Um, 
It uh, has internal four four megs of or four gigs. Gigabytes, <laughs> um, megabytes? No, I forget. No, it, it has internal uh, flash of four gigs, so that um, it has onboard applications that take up about a gig, and you've got about three gigs free to uh, do whatever you want. Um, it comes with some neat things. Let me. Uh, this is the first time I've ever used the external, so let me see if I can do both external and LCD. Wow, uh, that works. Um, it, it comes with a whole bunch of applications preloaded, like a web browser, um, open office, um, uh, various internet chatting, um, uh, science, some, some uh, games and applications and things like that. Uh, has a built-in webcam, so you can see me. Um, <laughs> It has um, some some built-in games, so you can be just as productive under Windows. This is you know, under Windows. Um, it, I use it mainly for web browsing. Um, if you are web browsing, you kind of have this um, problem that the uh, web browser is using up a large fraction of your space. So um, you can hit F11 and install an extra plugin to get rid of all the tabs and everything across the top, um, and that works pretty well. But on certain websites. Like Slashdot, uh, there's too much, uh, you know, junk going on. So um, you could probably install a Grease Monkey extension, but I use a program called Aardvark. Slashdot that, is optimized for IE. Uh, yeah, you can uh, do this, and you hit isolate, and now you can read it, um, you know, like like <clears throat> without uh, all the excess stuff like that. So there's lots of technologies you can use to make your websites uh, more usable, given the small screen. It's only 800 by 600. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, that's it. What do you hit on him, man? It just shows up. Wow. <laughs> it's like everything else. That's good resolution. Steve Jobs sold his shit with every machine. Figure it out. There we go. Okay. Just want to show a slideshow. So, uh, hey everyone, my name is Philip Mataris. Work for Agile Partners. It's pretty cool. Better than it looked on this one. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, I'm not much of a singer or dancer, but. Uh, Slideshow. Punch your feet. Yeah, there you go. I don't type wordy. It's got a letter on it. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. All right. Uh, the work involved in this uh, is actually done by my coworker John Barry. There was a designer named uh, Brendan something or other. I've forgotten his name though. But he came up with a technique called Cinema Redux. And the idea is you take a video, a whole movie, and you dump out one frame per second, get a whole directory of images, put them up as a poster. So and cover these empty walls. And then run real fast. Well, then you run real fast. <laughs> well, you're going you to have to do this. Uh, but it, you put it down the side of a, side, a skyscraper and then just jump. <laughs> <laughs> you can try it. We'll see. Uh, it produces some really neat effects, so one of the things that's cool is you can kind of see the style of the director and how they did their cuts. I kind of like to see different color bands. It's sort of neat. Uh, you put in a movie that has a lot of like thematic lighting or something, and you'll kind of see how the movie progresses through. Uh, John and I worked on a script that's on our website. I don't have any of the code for it, but I'll have the uh, address at the end so you can take a look. 
It's all in Ruby. It has nothing to do with websites. It has nothing to do with Rails. Uh, it does use R magic heavily. Uh, one of the, here's an example of 2001 Space Odyssey, <laughs> which is really incredible. Uh, you can see the whole desert. I don't know how the lighting is there, but towards the end when it starts to get really red is when Hal is you know, fighting with them and taking over the ship. Uh, totally cool. One of the problems we had when we came up with this, uh, John Barry came up with this to build as a poster, which was 20 inches by 30 inches at 500 DPI which was a massive, massive image, and it basically wrecked everyone's computer who tried to generate one of these. <laughs> so what we ended up having to do was we found out uh, after we had both written our, uh, our own methods for doing this, we found out our magic has a montage method built right in. Uh, <laughs> but it's not usable for this, so it was okay. We still got to proceed. Uh, the idea was montage method, uh, our magic has a thing called an image list, you load up a whole directory of the frames, and you hit one button, and it'll go through and scale them all uniformly and fit them on there. But too much memory problems, so we had to break it up into two passes. One pre-processing of the images, the other one then going through and using our magic to assemble it into a montage. But, uh, yeah, uh, I've actually not seen Helvetica, but John was telling me there's a lot of scenes where, you know, there's just a solid color on the screen, and that shows up pretty clearly. Of course, I'm such a nerd that I had to sit with my two DVDs of Star Wars, the special edition and the other one, and compare the two. <laughs> <laughs> they were so close it didn't even matter. But uh, in the special edition one, you see a lot more like pink spots showing up all over, I guess when they were going into hyperspace and Lucas added extra color. Uh, Willy Wonka was one of the ones I really wanted to try because I thought the really wacky tunnel scene would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a scene where, I don't know if you remember the movie, but they go through a river of something and weird lights and crazy videos playing. I mean, it's the most psychedelic part of the movie. Uh, and then John, of course, went through playing Super Mario Brothers, which added a lot of cool color banding. But I have to say, this is very addictive to play around with. I sat there for probably 10 hours yesterday ripping DVDs and <laughs> converting them. Uh, How long does it run take? Uh, not very long. It can take from 20 to 40 minutes. Once you've got the DVD ripped, uh, I used a program called Handbrake for the ripping, and it, some videos, I mean, they were taking three hours sometimes. I don't know if that's because I was busy doing other things on the computer or not, so. No, that's just how long it takes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, this was the website that John used for printing it. Uh, he said they had a pretty good deal. I think he had some trouble transferring the large file, so if anyone actually wants to try this, I think you had to go through and like reduce it with Photoshop, you know, with some JPEG compression, but maintaining the same resolution. And uh, that's it. You can find the script on the website. Any questions? How do you have the non-special edition of Star Wars on DVD? It came as the uh, the bonus disc on the latest DVD, yeah, which wasn't packaged until after he made everybody else buy the original special edition. <laughs> But you also get another copy of the, uh, you know, the messed with version that you can use as a coaster or whatever. So, all right. Thanks, guys. Who's got the shortest talk? Quick, quick, quick. And just to be clear, anyone who's getting in line now needs to talk to everyone who is in line and make sure that you're not in the back when you should be in the front. Shorter talks go first. Sizing is all going to be all messed up. So let me. Uh, shoot. Text mate. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to resize everything as we go, but that's okay because this is going to be short. Uh, my name is Peter Jaros. I am a senior at Bard College. It's up the river. 
Uh, it's in a tiny little town called Annandale. In fact, it is a tiny little town called Annandale. Uh, I, yes, and they are never coming back to Annandale. Uh, that is my current school, and uh, I am in the CS department. There are three professors. Each one of them has a senior to advise this year. It's a nice way to work. And everybody has a senior project at Bard. My senior project is Rubot. Rubot is a way to write robots. It is a really simple behavior-based robotics DSL in Ruby. Uh, basically, we were doing some uh, robotics work, behavior-based robotics, and I'll explain briefly how that works in a sec. Uh, and it was all in C++. It was for these really cute little robots, about this big. Uh, they roll around on the ground. They're from uh, mobile robotics, and they have a package called Aria. And Aria is all in C++, and we were doing work in C++, and I hate C++. And I love Ruby, so I thought, this is perfect. I'll make my entire project fixing that problem. So what is behavior-based robotics? Well, behavior-based robotics is a way to take some really simple uh, ideas about how you want the robot to act and combine them together into a very complicated idea. Uh, basically, oh yeah, tan, 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 tan. Now everyone knows who I pay attention to on Twitter. Give me back my control. Uh, basically, you have a robot object. Uh, it's actually a little more complicated in ARIA. There's a whole bunch of things, and this is part of what drove me to do this project. But essentially, you've got something that connects to a physical robot. And that physical ro or that robot object is going to have a bunch of behavior objects. And in this C++ system, those behaviors were defined as classes. Each one had to be its own class. And of course, defining a class in C++ is a whole bunch of code overhead that you'd rather not deal with if you don't have to. <coughs> Once you've got an instance of this on your robot, then when the robot runs, those behaviors are going to fire over and over and over and over and over again really quickly. And what the fire code is going to do is look at all the sensors of the robot that it cares about and decide what it wants the robot to do. Does it want it to move forward, move backward, turn, stop, whatever. And it's going to say, this is what I want the robot to do. So that's doing its calculation. But the thing is, there's a whole bunch of behaviors, and they're all yelling at the robot, do this, do that. And the robot has to decide which one of them does it listen to. And actually, uh, in this system, it's not going to listen to probably any of them in particular, it's going to use an arbitration system. Uh, ignore the coloring. I just thought the effect was nice. Uh, it's going to use some sort of arbitration system to say, this behavior has a higher priority than this one, so I'm going to listen to that one because it's telling me to move forward. But this other one with a lower priority is telling me to turn, and no one's telling me not to turn. So I'm going to go forward, and I'm going to turn. And in the end, the robot is kind of intelligent. Uh, it's a nice emergent intelligence thing. Intelligence is really too strong a word here, but it acts nicely. So this is the code that we wrote um, in our robotics class to uh, have a robot that would give a tour of our new science building. This was sort of the big thing at the beginning of the year, like we're going to build a robot and it's going to take the funders around the, the new building that they funded and they're going to be really proud of it. Uh, now, this is C++, so prepare for how much code this is. Here's the code, and, okay, this is the code, all right? <laughs> now, a, a bunch of that is comments, but not half of that. And this is already 821 lines. So there's a lot to work with there. I looked at it, and I said, this can't be right. I boiled it down, go away. And this is what I came up with. This is the translation into Rubot, which I did uh, <laughs> before I'd even implemented it. This was just sort of my, uh, my reference. And it looks like this. And that's the whole thing. It is 59 lines long with a couple comments and some good line spacing in there. And it's also readable. Uh, we've got a behavior, go, and it's going to take a couple arguments. Um, again, I'm abusing the Ruby uh, syntax much the way uh, Rake does. Uh, we're going to take in a max speed and a stop distance, 
Um, and then every time we fire, we're going to see how far in front of us something is, if there's something in front of us. And depending on how close we are to the next object in front of us, we're going to slow down. And once we get uh, too close to something, within the stop distance, we're going to stop completely. And as long as that is on the robot, it's going to go until it uh, almost runs into something. And then turn tells us if uh, it's going to compare how close things are on either side and decide which direction it should turn to. And this logic is very readable. It's very easy to see. Down here, we say we have a robot. We'll call him Fred because he needs a name for later on when we run him. We could have a bunch of robots set up in this file. Uh, and it's going to use the ARIA adapter. This is a completely extensible system. You can write an adapter for any robotic system. Uh, you could have one for LEGO Mindstorms if you uh, wanted to write a behavior-based system for it. But it is going to have to operate uh, tethered. It's going to have to be connected to a computer to do this, unless you're going to run Ruby on LEGO Mindstorms, in which case talk to me, because that's amazing. <laughs> uh, and we're going to need a sonar sensor. We're going to have these behaviors with these arguments. And we run it, and that's it. For the robot, or is it talking to it live, or how is it controlling? The ARI adapter is uh, an extension uh, that I wrote, which is the, the it's using the ARIA library, which is doing most of the heavy work. It's basically just translating between this and the style of code that I showed you before. Um, and just to, to let you know, um, at the Austin Ruby Com, was that right, Austin? You're talking about Shashank? Yeah, Shashank Day uh, yeah, uh, demoed Ruby on LEGO Mindstorms. So I think you can find that online. Let me give you a very brief demo. Well, let me not give you that demo. Uh, suffice to say, I can run it. It works, except for one little bug, which I'm going to fix. The code is online at GitHub. Uh, Pija is the name that I tend to go by online. It's called Rubot, and so that's where it is. Uh, it is not really packaged, so you can use it yet. Go away. Uh, but you can at least take a look at the code if you're interested. It'll get cleaned up as time goes on. But first, by Wednesday, I have to write about 25 pages still to go on it to <laughs> hand in. So I'm going to be a little crazy this weekend and the beginning of this week. I have to take a two-hour train ride. Maybe I'll get some work done, but thank you. Good night. Also, if you like Ruby and you like robots, um, stay tuned. Is this your cable? Uh, that, 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 yes. Yeah. Don't screw them in, people. Get nice and warm. Yeah. Waste valuable seconds. <laughs> Play some drum and bass. <laughs> oh, no, it's, 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 that's the old style. It's, I've done that. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm getting carried away there. Um, okay, so I'm not going to play some drum and bass. Um, I'm going to... Can you see it? Okay, this is... Uh, I can now reveal that uh, Peter's comments about uh, Mindstorms is actually a setup. Uh, this is a Mindstorms robot, which is actually running a program uh, which was initially written in uh, Ruby and then translated. It doesn't run on the Mindstorms machine the way it does with uh, the gem that you mentioned, because I saw that demoed in Portland, too. Um, but this, what it does is it generates something called NXC, and you can then, uh, it also compiles it, and you can just transfer the file on there. Uh, you'll notice that this robot is kind of dumb, that it just goes round in a circle. Um, that's pretty much all the functionality that is actually supported. Um, I'm just going to do a super quick run through of, of four different things actually. Rubots is one of them. And this is the spec for how it works. Here's, um, this is the C or NXC, not exactly C, uh, which it generates. And this is how you write the program in Ruby. And you see it's actually longer instead of shorter, which is one of the flaws with this. Um, another flaw is that the ultrasonic sensor is the only thing it supports. And really weirdly, um, because we just, you know, this was not planned, but mine is, instead of being called Rubot, it's called Rubots, with a Z. Um, okay, so real quick, password, right? This is what I use to store my passwords. You do gem install password, 
And obviously, you don't put your bank password in there, but for like your Twitter password, your your Facebook password, you know, I, I don't keep track of that shit, right? I mean, there's no point remembering it, right? <laughs> That's for robots to do. That's for computers to do. So when I when I join a new like social networking site, I just do password dash G, capital G for generate, and uh, you know the name of the site and the, my username on there, and it just generates a password and it stores it in a YAML file. So it's got like 50 passwords in there. I never remember any password except for like my bank or my, you know, something like that. Okay. Uh, next up is this thing, Utility Belt. And uh, Greg Brown, who was talking before, uh, helped code the most interesting feature in Utility Belt. Utility Belt is a set of uh, like nifty whatnot for IRB. So you go inside IRB and you can get history. Uh, this is something Ben Blathing wrote. So you can get all your uh, IRB command history. Uh, and if you want to go into VI or Emacs and, you know, puts uh, hello world, like that, uh, and then you quit out of the text editor, um, it executes the code. And you can also do it with TextMate or Emacs. Um, and in fact, you could do it with any um, command line accessible editor. Any editor you can run from the command line, you can run from uh, utility belt. So that's pretty cool. And uh, then there's two more things. No, there's one more thing. Okay, rock, paper, scissors. Um, I'm not going to load it up, but what it does is you've probably heard of, you know, naive Bayesian classifiers, right? This is for uh, spam detection, right? Well, naive Bayes uh, is Bayes without prediction, right? Or without inference, right? It just categorizes, right? Uh, rock, paper, scissors uses real Bayes. It doesn't do like a, a network. It doesn't do back propagation. But you can use it to basically predict what people are going to click. Um, and you can find this. It's on Ruby Forge or my blog, or it's somewhere. I don't know where. But um, hold on. Giles. Uh, it's, it's easier to remember than most of my project names. Rock, paper, scissors. Pretty easy, right? Uh, and what, what it does is it gives you an app with, uh, it's a Rails app where you can log in as a user and then you can click something, right? And there's a bunch of things and categories and when you click one thing, it records, you know, how often this user clicks that. And it'll be able to say, you know, if I go here and then I go here, you are probably user X. And uh, that's, that's it. I'm done. No, I don't want it that way. I want it this way. Okay. Okay, so uh, get out of the way. I am Eric Hodel, and uh, I'm Seattle from Seattle RB, and I'm a maintainer of RDoc, I guess the maintainer. Yes, and um, one of the things I half finished uh, just now is frameless RDoc except for this giant list of crap at the bottom. So if somebody knows CSS can help me make a menu out of that at the Hackfest, that'd be sweet. And uh, as proof here, yeah, I have some HTML source. And look, you can see that there's, there's no frames in here. And uh, so I've been making changes and improvements to RDoc. So if you're interested in helping out with this thing, there's uh, the RDoc project on RubyForge. And you can see here we got some actual real activity sent, which is all recent because it was registered, you know, three years ago. That's it. And that will go into core. Oh, yeah, and it's going into core. Two frames. You know what's better about frames? Hey, my name is Luke Melia. Um, I work uh, with we, at WePlay. And uh, let's see. Oh, so this is sort of a mashup of the talk of some talks. So uh, I was inspired by Ryan's talk about um, hurting code. I figured I wanted to find out what kind of code we could hurt. 
And then uh, I was inspired by Ryan's talk about flog. And so I figured I'd use flog to figure it out. And then uh, was, I think we was reminded about Saki, which I'd sort of forgotten about by Chris's talk. And so I uh, made a little Saki task that uh, anybody can use here. Let me make this a little more accessible. So um, it, this is pretty simple. It basically uh, gets your Git log, figures out uh, what files are the most um, frequently changed in history over the history of the project, and then runs flog against those. So basically you end up with your top 15 files that change the most and just how bad they are. Um, and so if you want, if you want it, you can uh, grab it at, from lukemelia.com. It is um, the first post. That's my daughter. <laughs> it's the first post here, and there's a link for Saki. And I figured I'd just real quick show you guys how to install Saki if you've never used it, or how to um, install a task with Saki if you've never used it. So the pasty that's linked there um, has the Saki task. Where it's just like looks just like a rape task. Um, so I'm running, running Saki-i to install it. And now it installed that task, analyzed commits, most changed files. Um, and oops, I'm going to run it. And we get. Uh, Sure. We have uh, more than I expected actually coming back for some reason. But anyway, user RB, not surprisingly, in our project uh, has been changed 228 times, and it's also uh, the biggest defender flog wise score of 1185. And, and so, anyway, we know what to focus on next time we've got a couple of cycles. So that's it. There's a mirror button. <laughs> OK, um, I'm Chris Wanstroff. I'm one of the GitHub guys. And I wanted to show something real quickly that I alluded to earlier. It's called oil. It's kind of something that me and Tom Preston Warner are working on in the side. And basically, um, I think at RubyConf, there was talk about everyone needs to write a lisp. So here you go. Uh, this, is, this is it, basically. We wanted it to be prototype and object oriented. Um, and we also wanted to have like a, a more consistent kind of syntax and feel and rules. This, this, it looks very similar to Ruby code, yes. This, it's not a real Lisp, but this, is, uh, this actually runs in oil. And this is another example of it. So basically, the way that we had it set up is um, symbols are kind of consistent in how they're, they're used. Um, you don't have to back tick anything. Uh, every uh, method that you call gets past the, the tail sort of deal. So anyway, these are some uh, little examples of things. It's kind of prefix notation right now. And the cool part, of course, is that I mean, you can see the grammar here. Um, comments are actually part of the code, so you can grab them at runtime and do whatever you want with them. Um, basic stuff, if statements. But the neat part is uh, that we did it in treetop, and the grammar is only like 50 lines. And it does, so far, this part we consider finished. It's all in the implementation right now. And it's just, if you haven't seen it, it's treetop.rubyforge.org. And it's really simple, really cool way to get a parse tree of stuff and do stuff with it. So. This is it right here. It's just. I mean, just the basic kind of examples. Um, I could probably do something like. Yeah, hello world. All right, that's it. What do you mean by prefix right now? Um, because of the way we set up the rules, it's, let's see if I can get an example. 
Maybe. We don't have them yet. We're, we're working on the uh, implementation right now, the inside, how we're going to do the stack and stuff. But the way that we did it is that, so puts is a symbol and hello world is a string. Any, the head of any Lisp that gets um, run, that gets processed, it tries to see if the, the head has a call method. And if so, it passes the tail to the call method. So basically, you could do one space plus space two and pass plus and one to the call method of the first uh, item in the list if you wanted and just kind of change the rules on the fly in actual oil. Um, we haven't actually, I mean, I did that, but it was, we're kind of changing things really quickly. So it's, the point of it is that we want to write on top of Ruby. We want to make it simple. It's kind of a fun thing. We want to be, have it to reach into Ruby, and we want to be able to kind of like with these really basic consistent rules, make it do crazy things and hopefully macros and stuff like that. Also, because treetop is written in Ruby, eventually we should be able to hook into treetop and redefine the grammar while the program's running from the program, which I don't really know how to do it yet, but if we do, it's going to be sick. All right. <laughs> All right, I'm Paul. Hello again. I've missed you. Uh, I just wanted to show up off uh, show here. Aha. Uh, OK, so I mentioned Bassett. Um, here, we'll quit that earlier. It will, at the end of my talk. So I just wanted to show that real quick. Uh, it's just right now it's just for doing uh, feature selection and naive Bayes classification. So this is an example. I ran it on. So classifying uh, something, in this case, I'm testing like classifying text. So uh, I used um, the news group stuff and like alt.rec.hockey and alt.rec.baseball. So classifying whether a document, a new document, is going to be either about baseball or about hockey. Um, so this is just the output of like, uh, I mentioned like doing cross-validation. So the different like pieces that Bassett includes are the actual, um, like the classification evalu evaluator, which is for doing uh, cross-validation. And um, I, I had mentioned that I, I wanted to be generic, so it's not intrinsically like tied to just classifying text. Like you could do other types of things with it. Um, and like I said, as a feature extractor, which is based on chi-squared, um, so, Let's see. Oh, I guess I'll just show this real quick, which is, um, here, let me pump that up. Okay. Okay, so basically I just create a new evaluator um, and for the evaluator, I just say compare against Bassett classifiers. Um, and I have two classes that I'm feeding in. And, or, sorry, I'm, I'm using just, actually just the Bassett naive base, so I'm not really, I can also use it to compare against other classification algorithms as well. And I uh, pass it this block, so, which tells it to create the new classifier, go through the training set, um, and train on it and go through the testing set and test on it. And the thing is, like, the evaluator actually breaks, breaks it all up into the different chunks uh, for you. So, but anyway, I'm looking to add, like, uh, clustering and some other uh, classification algorithms to it. So if you're interested, hit me up and we can hack on it. Wilson.
things aren't lined up anymore. Oops. So I'm Wilson Belkovich, and I work for Engine Yard on the Rubinius project. And I'm going to bore you people with some intricate details of Ruby's constant system. And does anyone have an opinion of what this code, if you can see it, is going to do when bigger, I run it? Bigger, bigger. Much bigger. Ah. Bigger, bigger. Yes. <laughs> bigger. Oh, okay, well, if it needs to be that big, we're going to be in trouble when we switch files. But does anyone have a vote? It's going to warn. Okay, it's going to warn. But it should look it up. Okay, so the consensus is it's going to warn, but it's going to look it up. And you guys are root crows because you're right. But that's crazy. <laughs> because that is completely not the name that constant has. So I'm introducing this as background as a weird Ruby habit. Also, I have no prepared talk, so be forgiving. That's too big. Too small? Uh-oh. Heck yeah. Indeed it is. Okay, well this doesn't really fit on the screen, but has anyone seen Rails raise this error? A copy of whatever has been removed from the module tree but is still active. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, the reason that happens is that Rails is crazy. <laughs> and it runs all of this code that we're looking at that doesn't fit on the screen because of the font every time it can't find a constant. And it does all sorts of fun Byzantine things and it has code like substituting object for kernel. That does something. I'm sure that does something. <laughs> so, I ran into the whole story here because I was trying to get Merb running on Rubinius. And Merb has this file called autoload.rb where it does the equivalent of what we just saw in Rails. And it says, Hello. in particular, whenever something called Merb colon colon config is referenced, then you should go require this Merb core slash config file. It seems reasonable. And that didn't work at all. And Merb didn't start. But it appears to be used heavily, so it seems important. And as we saw in the crazy WTF file over there, you can't really just expect that a constant isn't going to be found just because it isn't in place yet. It might just keep looking up. So the reason this code didn't work in Rubinius is that we have a top-level constant for now called config. And we happily implement all these MRI rules for looking up constants, and we said, oh cool, there's a config constant in the top level, we're done. Well, that wasn't the config Merb was looking for. So the time had come to make autoload actually work the way it is supposed to work. So we wrote all these specs. And it turns out you can do terrible, terrible things in Ruby, like asking for an autoload and then going ahead and requiring the file that you said you wanted it to require first, so that when it fires, it's already been required and it doesn't require it and terrible, terrible things happen. So, step two here is how easy this is to fix in Rubinius because Rubinius is awesome. So I had to write, for the moment, a little bit of C code, but I only had to write two lines. And I said, if this is an auto loady thing, then call this Ruby method. Otherwise, do whatever you were doing before I opened this file. <coughs> and so here is autoload. This is all of it. So we make an autoload. And the way we saw it over here, uh, if I can click, is you give it a name you're looking for and a place to go get the code. So we initialize it, blah, blah, blah. We add it to a list, et cetera, et cetera. And then here we are. This is what actually gets called by that C code that we were just looking at. So it sends this call message to the auto little thing, and it requires. And it turns out that require, because you can require the file by hand and not ever hit the auto load, 
require has to go in and clear out the auto loads. So it runs these two lines of code and removes it from the list. And then loads the file as you'd expect and then gets itself. And we're done. And I can't remember if I had anything else to talk about. <laughs> Which is presumably an occupational hazard. All right, anyone have any questions? About Constance or Rubinius or C? I'll unplug. When's your going to be done? <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Which Thursday is in question? <laughs> I hesitate to make statements that <coughs> could potentially be recorded, but <laughs> Merb actually serves up pages now and stuff, and pretty soon it'll be serving up actual apps that have more than Hello World in them. So that's progress. I'm not sure how we define done, though. That's tricky. Ruby done? No. <laughs> <coughs> Anyone else want to talk? I think we're pretty much good for time. So I, I got one thing to show. Oh, come no, on. It, that's <laughs> over. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a finish off. Since uh, my initial proposal was rejected, I can't help you. That wasn't your proposal, that was you. I was rejected. No, So, I gave a talk earlier about asceticism and pairing back and, and being as simple as possible. And I wanted to show you something um, that I think is awesome. I didn't write it, Stephen Baker wrote it. He's, he's one of the people that gets it. And uh, this is beautiful. How many people here use uh, RSpec? And, uh, and if you don't, you know, keep your hands up. And if you don't use RSpec, how many people use uh, one of the other mocking frameworks? So I think we're talking between half and two-thirds. So I have something pretty to show. And because I don't have the mirror button on this laptop, I have to do that. <clears throat> but this should actually, that's the last end, so that fits. That's a mock framework. There's no scroll bar. That's it. That is as small and pretty as you can get. And that was written in half an hour on an airplane while going to or from a, a job interview. Um, Stephen Baker contributed this to the, to the uh, I, I did a little massaging on it, but this is it. So it is, I think, um, 33 lines long and uh, has your little expects and a verify method and does what you think it should do. Uh, it actually has um, a fair number of specs to go with it, um, or actually unit tests to go with it. And uh, this is one of the things that's contributing to a mini unit having uh, a test framework that is 100% API compatible, user API compatible with uh, test unit, um, a spec engine, which is not compatible with anyone else, I don't think, um, but is clean and, and simple to implement and to use, and mocks in less than a thousand lines of code, including the test form. That's it. <laughs>